Hello to everyone who is uh, live uh, in Berlin and to everyone else who's tuning in from all over the world. Um, this is a presentation on how we updated Drupal's code of conduct. So um, I'm George Demet. Um, I am the uh, founder and CEO of Palantir.net, an open source consultancy uh, based uh, near Chicago, uh, USA. Um, uh, not affiliated with another firm with a similar name, um, but uh, we've been working with open source uh, software for over 25 years now. Um, I uh, was a founding member of uh, Drupal's community, the Drupal Community Working Group's conflict resolution team, uh, where I uh, worked on code of conduct enforcement and conflict resolution for eight years. I'm still involved with that group as a member of the community health team, uh, which is responsible for proactive uh, measures to help with community health, but uh, not directly involved with conflict resolution. And uh, many, many years ago, I was also the co-author of Drupal's Code of Conduct for Events. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. For those who are not familiar with the Drupal project, uh, we are one of the largest independent open source projects in the world. Um, we're overseen by the Drupal Association, which is a US-based nonprofit. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of active contributors, um, and uh, Drupal is an open source content management platform, digital experience platform that's used by millions and millions of sites, uh, everywhere from personal blogs, corporate, enterprise-wide sites. It's used as a backend for um, a lot of really cool web-based applications, and it's been around, uh, you know, since 2001, so uh, well over 20 years, we have a very large, very robust community. Uh, the way that community management works in Drupal um, is that the we have a community code of conduct, uh, which is maintained and enforced by the community working group, which is a volunteer group. Um, they have oversight and support provided by the community elected members of the board of the Drupal Association. That's that nonprofit that oversees the project. Uh, there's uh, an event code for the uh, semi-annual DrupalCon conference uh, that's maintained and enforced by the paid staff of the Drupal Association. And then there's a wide number, dozens and dozens of local community meetups and Drupal camps all over the world. Um, those are, again, largely independent volunteer events. Those are events are responsible for maintaining and enforcing their own codes of conduct although a lot of them kind of get together and they've used, uh, you know, very similar uh, language. They have best practices that they share. So well, let me tell you about the situation. Um, this was, uh, we have, Drupal has, was a fairly early to the game in adopting a code of conduct as an open source project. Uh, we adopted a code of conduct in 2010. Uh, it was uh, based on what was then the current version of the Ubuntu Code of Conduct. Um, it was modified slightly in 2014 uh, to add some language around conflict resolution. And the situation was that for several years, um, we've been receiving feedback from the community that the Code of Conduct um, needed to be updated to bring it kind of more in line with what um, folks were expecting from other open source projects. Um, and their and their communities, um, specifically more uh, language uh, around um, anti-harassment. Um, you know, the the code that we had basically just said harassment is not tolerated, but it wasn't specific into what that meant. Um, clarity around what spaces uh, are subject to the code of conduct. Uh, does it apply to you know uh, community-run Slack channels? Facebook pages, uh, other things of that nature, um, many of which are, are kind of run and organized by volunteers. Uh, what are the consequences of violating the code of conduct? Um, again, the, the, the document does not make that super clear. Um, and it also, uh, we heard from the community that they were um, interested in hearing you know, sort of what the expectations were for community members and leadership roles, right? These are folks who set an example for your project, whether they're speakers at an event or maintainers of, uh, you know, 
contributed modules and projects within the community um, or even people just leading different initiatives on the project. So um, that was that was another piece of feedback. Um, we, there have been several surveys and community conversations that have been had going back as uh, far as 2017 um, and then a follow-up survey that we did in 2019. Um, and what we heard was that uh, a lot of folks felt that any changes that were made to the code of conduct really need to incorporate it uh, a, a diverse group of voices uh, from our global community that they, again, that they did not want it to be a U.S. or North American or Western European perspective. So um, after a couple false starts, we finally got going um, in the middle of last year, um, you know, when we kind of gotten past the, uh, the worst of the pandemic and we're ready to get moving. And um, what happened was the, uh, the conflict resolution team, which is responsible for maintaining the code of conduct, put together a seven person team uh, to begin the process. Um, I was uh, one of the folks who headed up that team um, as somebody with a lot of experience and background in uh, enforcing the existing code of conduct, understanding what some of its challenges were, um, some of the, uh, you know, the questions and concerns that had come up. Um, so what we did is we began uh, with a chartering exercise in Miro. Um, those who haven't used Miro, it's an online whiteboard tool uh, where we defined kind of what our shared goals were, um, measures of success, opportunities, constraints, and um, documented all of those and put them on little stickies in this board. And um, then uh, really started focusing on like, okay, what are the different steps in the process? What are the things that we have to do um, in order to get, uh, you know, from where we are now to where we want to be with an updated and revised code of conduct? Uh, and then uh, we basically mapped that all out. Uh, we used Trello uh, to define, uh, you know, what those steps were along the way. We divided them up into two-week sprints. Our, our group met every two weeks. Uh, the other thing we agreed to do was to post public updates on our progress to the Drupal community blog. Um, and that was, you know, we really wanted folks to be aware that this was happening and going on um, and to be as transparent as we could about the progress. We weren't going to share everything we were doing with the entire community right away, um, but we wanted them to be aware. We wanted them to know that uh, we were going to be soliciting community feedback and input as part of this process. All right, step two, identifying uh, stakeholders. We knew that our seven person group wasn't large enough to make all the decisions. We wanted, really wanted to make sure we had that input uh, from people across our community, um, from people from all, you know, as many areas of the world as we could get um, people who worked with the project in different ways, uh, whether that's security working group, event organizers, um, there's a diversity and inclusion group that's active in the Drupal community. We definitely wanted to get their perspective um, and input, um, Drupal Association staff, uh, accessibility experts, and uh, people from different groups all over our global community. And this was really important as we prioritized outreach to non-US and non-Western European community members. We knew we would have lots of folks, uh, you know, who are very active in the US, you know, in North America and in Western Europe and the UK, but we knew we needed to do a little bit more to reach out and invite those people from outside, you know, our, uh, you know, those geographic regions in order to really get a full perspective. Um, Next step, step three, we then went and reviewed a code, widely used, well-known codes of conduct from open source and open source adjacent communities. So uh, a lot of these are very familiar, uh, you know, whether it's the contributor covenant, which is used by a lot of open source projects. Um, we looked at an updated version of the Ubuntu code, um, the codes from Fedora, uh, Alley Talks, Learn WordPress, Decoupled Days, which is uh, an event uh, that uh, is Drupal adjacent, um, and the Inspiral Handbook. Inspiral is a 
a group of uh, it's 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 a group focused around self organization, and so and they have a lot of really interesting uh, things in their handbook that we we thought were interesting and a little bit unique. Um, so then we assigned uh, different codes to different people in the group. Uh, they went through each person went through and kind of identified what the core elements of each of these codes of conduct were, right? So it's whether, hey, this code has a statement of shared values or uh, examples of positive and negative behaviors, right? Um, enforcement expectations. And then uh, we, again, going back to Miro, we sort of mapped all those out uh, on a board as, uh, as stickies. And then we, we did uh, voting as a group. We used dot voting to decide between us which elements were ones that we thought were things that we must have in our code of conduct, which were things we thought we should have, and which were things we thought would be nice to have. So then, but this was the point where then we needed to uh, kind of get some external validation that we were on the right track. And uh, so we took, um, we created a Google Doc where we, uh, had elements again the, those those outline elements that we did from the uh, the block voting exercise with excerpts from the language of each of those codes of conduct and uh, so it was organized it's like hey these are these are the things we think our, our code of conduct must have should have would be nice to have and then we shared that with this this group of um, community stakeholders again we didn't share it out to the whole community because it was very raw it wasn't something that we felt if we shared it out, we would get uh, really good, meaningful feedback. But by sharing again with that smaller, but, you know, geographically uh, uh, diverse group of contributors and community stakeholders uh, who were able to provide us with some really clear focused feedback, we could make sure that we were on the right track. And it was really great that we did because uh, there were a lot of things that we discovered. We um, it needed to be thinking about and considering, right? Uh, using uh, easier to read language was a really strong piece of feedback. Um, a lot of existing codes of conduct are written in language that is very complex um, and very difficult to understand, even if you are, um, even if English is your first language, but especially if English is not your first language. Um, you know, discussion of how we wanted to word different examples of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And again, pointing out, um, making us aware that there were certain words and phrases uh, that might have different meanings to people in communities of color, right? Uh, res um, one of the words was, um, and there was a word about um, respectability that, that we needed to be really careful about how we use that word because it, it means different things uh, to different folks. So then revisions, 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 yes. Uh, so then we took the next few weeks, we took all that feedback that we had gotten and that initial outline, and we took and we started to create um, our own original draft from it, incorporating the stakeholder feedback. Uh, and this was just a process, an iterative process where we would go through and every meeting we would review the draft, we would uh, you know, see where it was at. We would make additional edits. Um, we spent a lot of time um, using tools um, such as Hemingway Editor and Readable to make the text as easy to read and easy to understand as possible. This was really challenging. There's a lot of really uh, difficult, complicated concepts that a code of conduct has to communicate, a lot of nuance. And um, so, you know, for me, it was a real challenge to, to try to use that very plain, very direct, very straightforward language. Um, and then we, when we had, an, had made those revisions and we had that initial draft, we then again shared it with our stakeholder group, shared it with the full community health team um, for additional review and suggestions. So at this point, it's, it's maybe a couple dozen people um, who are looking at it. Um, and then once we had in, incorporated again that that second round of feedback from our stakeholders and we agreed that the draft was finally ready to share um, we did as we do everything in Drupal we created an issue on Drupal.org 
uh, to solicit feedback from the community, basically via a uh, comment thread. Um, but we knew that there were some people who were not going to be comfortable participating in a public discussion. So we allowed people to also share their feedback privately or anonymously via Google form. Um, along with the draft uh, for community review, we wrote a blog post really describing the process, why we were doing this, um, what changes we were proposing, what the process uh, had been to date and what the next steps were. Uh, we used our different community channels, social media, Slack, uh, email newsletters, et cetera, to make sure that as many people as possible were aware. Uh, we did not ourselves participate in the discussion except to answer some clarifying questions um, and, uh, and actually also to ask questions of folks when they said, uh, when they had some feedback, just to understand what it was um, they were saying. And the really important thing here is we, we time boxed that feedback period to three weeks. Um, and that was about time, uh, enough time. We really had most of our comments in the first week or two, and then it kind of trickled off after that. Um, so we really gave folks that opportunity. Anyone who had something to say could share it there. So uh, then we next step was to create a final draft. Um, so we incorporated um, a lot of the, actually a lot of the feedback we received during the community review period into a finalized draft. There were some things we didn't, uh, we didn't incorporate it because, um, you know, it conflicted with what we already had or, you know, violated the principles that we were aiming for. Um, so we really, um, but there were quite a few things that came in that were really constructive, really helped us, uh, you know, again, hone and clarify this document more. Um, and so when we got to a final uh, draft um, that was approved by our group, um, we shared it with the conflict resolution team who's responsible for maintaining the code of conduct. They had a couple of uh, suggestions we also incorporated and, um, and we created, um, and this is kind of the place where we're at right now. Uh, so we have an unpublished test page on Drupal.org um, that illustrates how the new code of conduct will appear on the site. Because we are including examples of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors for each one of the kind of main principles in our code, um, it, it, it appeared very long when we posted it in the issue queue, um, but we were able to use some tools to basically um, kind of hide uh, those examples by default, but you can click on them to see them. Um, and that makes the code of conduct uh, a lot shorter, easier to read, easier to scan. Um, so where we're at in the process right now, we're almost there. Um, the conflict resolution team is uh, currently reviewing the finalized draft. Uh, they're bringing in uh, their, uh, their kind of oversight panel, which uh, includes some the community elected members of the Drupal Association Board um, and uh, an outside representative who is very experienced in uh, community management. Um, so once that process is complete, the new code of conduct will be published, announced to the community, and everyone who is involved in Drupal, we give contribution credits uh, to people who, um, you know, uh, participate uh, you know, in things that don't involve code. And so we'll make sure that uh, everyone involved, um, if they want to, uh, will receive uh, credit for that. So what did we learn? Um, quite a few lessons here, actually. Um, we, um, I think the biggest one uh, for me was uh, setting a goal and milestones early in the process, um, really having a team of people um, you know, who is there to provide support. I'd mentioned, you know, we, we held our survey in 2019, but it wasn't until 2022 that we really got started on this. Um, we had a couple false starts, we had a pandemic, um, and, uh, but really the key was sitting down and being like, okay, what are the steps? What needs to happen? Um, how many rounds of review? Um, we made some changes along the way. Um, we realized that we maybe didn't need as much time to do some of some things and we maybe needed more time to do other things. And so we were able to adjust on the fly and that was really, really helpful. Um, we set a goal um, of six months uh, and, uh, and we met that timeline. We started in uh, uh, 
June of last year, and we had our finalized draft uh, shared uh, with the community, uh, uh, with the uh, conflict resolution team in mid-December. Um, so uh, yeah, so from that, that standpoint, it was, it was a lot of work, but we, we really kind of stuck to our milestones and that was really important. Um, I can't say enough about having a diverse group of people um, who are able to review the draft early in the process uh, to help catch issues, which if we had, you know, uh, gone ahead and, and, and shared with the community, um, I think at large, it would have been really, really challenging. Um, so I'm really, really glad that we, um, we were able to do that. We were able to catch those issues very early in the process. Um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, again, something I didn't expect, um, but really came out of this process was just understanding how many of the most widely used codes of conduct in the open source community are written using uh, complex language. Um, you know, I, I love the contributor covenant, but it's written at, um, at a reading level for people who are uh, at college or university. And, uh, you know, and, and so really, and it's, it's, and you really, you want to aim for, you know, uh, uh, something, a language level that, that, anyone, as many people as possible can read. And so simplifying that language took a lot of time and a lot of effort, um, but it will make it a lot easier for um, us to translate into other languages. Um, it, um, I'm really glad we spent that time there. Um, yeah, when soliciting feedback, um, always um, provided a, a way for people to, to share their thoughts uh, privately, anonymously, um, you get a few insights there that uh, people wouldn't share um, in a in a public, you know, uh, forum or thread. Um, so that's really, really important. And again, just being very patient. These things take time. Um, as I mentioned, it took us six months to get to where we are now. Um, and then it's been, you know, three months for that, uh, you know, the final review process. Um, and, you know, and that's still ongoing, but uh, hopefully soon in the coming weeks, we'll be um, sharing our work, um, the final product publicly. In the meantime, uh, you know, you can go through and you can see the process and everything, um, you know, that we've done to date and that initial draft that we shared with the community. So uh, thank you. Um, that is my presentation. Um, if folks have any uh, questions, and if we have time, I am uh, happy to answer them. Um, if you want to uh, connect with me, I've got my Mastodon and LinkedIn there. I'm happy to hear from you, um, either here and now or later on. So thank you very much, George. This this was a very good presentation. Really, I, I, I was already expecting. Um, <laughs> Th nice things, but the whole process that you described made me like really think about a lot of things. It's uh, if you forget it's about the the code of conduct for Drupal, you can think that this is like a, a framework or or a way of of processing change for stuff that is very humane and very uh, inclusive, very democratic. I am I am really. Uh, I'll certainly use this presentation as a reference in the future for Thank you. this kind of stuff. It was a team stuff. effort. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have uh, at the moment questions from the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, post them in our, um, in our platform. I posted the link in the chat and you can also reach it directly from the button uh, below the video in the platform. So I have some questions of my own. Well, one, some of them you already answered, like how long did it take? I think you mentioned yep. it took like six months. I was like, even expecting more based on like the, the whole thing that happened. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, can you estimate more or less how many people were involved? You mentioned like there was a team, I think of seven, then stakeholders yep. and the community. So we had, uh, we had a core group of seven people. Um, and then there were probably um, that initial uh, group of community stakeholders that was probably about another dozen or so people on top of that. 
And then, um, and then when we shared it with our community health team, um, that's another, I think, 20 people or so. So there's some overlap there. So I, I would say probably two to three dozen um, people, um, you know, really working in some way and providing review. That core group of seven people um, really did most, you know, of the heavy lifting, those draft revisions and everything. Um, and, uh, and then, um, yeah. And then, you know, beyond that, again, sharing with our community, we got, um, we, we got a, we got a fair amount of feedback during that process. It, it wasn't as, uh, as many people as I was expecting. Um, but, um, but, you know, again, there were, there were probably another, you know, at least another couple dozen or so people who participated in that. Yeah, I, I like the, the thing in the process that, so you probably heard this saying that is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go yep. together. And what you did was bridging both, like starting yeah. with a small group and then broadening up, but at the end, ultimately taking feedback from the larger community, which is super nice. Yeah, and, and that was actually a lesson I had learned uh, when we did the event code about 10 years ago, um, which was we had a very small group that created the draft and then we went straight from that to sharing with everyone. And that was a mistake. <laughs> we, we, uh, we realized there were so many things that we, we hadn't caught uh, during the process or that people, you know, from different areas of the world, uh, you know, were not going to be able to get on board with. And so, um, you know, we had to go back and, and make massive revisions in that process. But this one went a lot more smoothly. Yeah, that, that's very nice that you also mentioned, like you wanted to have a very broad perspective and um, already from the beginning thought about having people from all over the world. I mean, it's yeah. um, sometimes it's very easy to to think that most of the action happens in the US or Europe and and forget about these communities. I am I am Latin American. I'm from Brazil. And it's uh, it's always nice when people mention, hey, let's take a, a oh, yeah. broader perspective yeah absolutely um so one last question i think before we close or maybe we'll have time for one more this is not really technical or for the it's about the presentation but are you a fan of outlander i think i saw me ah uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> uh okay, yeah i I, I i i have watched uh outlander um and uh yeah i, I threw that one in because uh you know poor poor jamie there looked like he just needed some help um but uh <laughs> yeah i i i i i I've seen and I'm a fan of just about everything, uh, all the all the images in there. So <laughs> nice. And I think we have time for one more before we close to it. Very briefly, did you see changes like in the community or feedback or reactions after you published it? I mean, how was it received more? Uh, so so it was it was, uh, you know, it was about what I expected, which was actually generally quite good. A lot of the, mm -hmm. the comments were, were really just focused on some nitpicky details. Um, there were a couple of very specific things that some long-term contributors um, found found challenging um, in, mm -hmm. in the proposed text. And, um, and, so, uh, and so it was really good that we caught those things um, during, um, during the community review process. Um, we, um, you know, I was, I was really worried that we would have people come in and say, oh, why do we need a code of conduct at all? You shouldn't be doing this. We didn't have that feedback. Um, I, I think uh, at this point, uh, you know, pretty much everyone uh, hopefully understands mm -hmm. and recognizes why these mm -hmm. things are important. Um, so I was, I was pretty happy with the feedback we received. Interestingly enough, um, some of the feedback we received was around language that we didn't change. So <laughs> there were <laughs> there were there were things that have been in the code of conduct since 2010 um, mm -hmm. that people were like, you know what, and we, that we that we didn't change as part of the process. They're like, no, we should change this. I'm like, okay, great, thank you. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 so so that was that was uh, that was actually really good to see um, that you know. At least in the process so far, folks have been really open and willing. And, you know, I think it just speaks to our community is like, yeah, you know, these things 
a code of conduct needs to, in some ways, be a living document to adapt and change mm -hmm. as your community grows and changes. Perfect. Thanks a lot. It's a pity we have to close now because this was a very interesting conversation. I could probably ask you, <laughs> keep asking you more questions. Well, I go on for hours, but you've got, <laughs> yeah. you got, you got other folks we need to hear from. <laughs>